Mean your Bibles to the Gospel of John. We've had a lot of interruptions, but we're back in the Gospel of John. We're going to look at John chapter 10. Some of you are saying, why is there magnolia leaves all over the church? We had a wedding yesterday. Lauren Webb is no longer Lauren Webb. She is Lauren Sertian. And while we were doing the wedding, there were this, everything was full. We had young adults on this side and young adults on that side. We had young kids in the middle, and it was pretty packed out. And uh, I noticed something yesterday. I had a wedding, and then my father had a, a, an engagement down in King William, so we went to the wedding reception, watched Lauren and Zach dance, and then we left and went to my father's. But at both events and at the wedding, there were these little kids, and I I don't know if I'm becoming a people watcher. I guess that's maybe because I'm getting older, but you, you sit, watch, and ponder. And what I watched yesterday was very interesting. We got to the reception, and there was a, a grandfather holding one of the girls that was in the wedding, and she was squirming and kicking and being strong-willed, and she went and get to grandma. Well, she got to grandma, just ran right over. It was done. Granddaddy was forgotten. And then we went to the birthday, and there was young kids there. And I noticed something. Some kids, parents and grandparents, their words have weight. And some parents and grandparents don't. Let me tell you what I mean by weight. I mean they have influence and power and credence with their child. Now there's a lot of variables for that. So if you're here, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just trying to show you what I observed yesterday. I noticed there were some parents that would say, Yell, Karen, now stop that. And she would instantly stop. And then there's another one. Hey, Heidi, will you stop? Heidi, Heidi, come back. Heidi, come back here. Heidi. And she was gone. Mom was gone. So was Heidi. Gone. There was others that would say, do you do that? No. What do you do? And they do the right thing. And then there was others that were negotiating. Do we? No. No, no, we're not doing it. No, we're not doing it. That, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. No weight. They have no weight. And our heart goes out to those parents, don't we? Just Our heart just breaks. And then we do this. Am I like that? Which parent am I? Now, there's a lot of variables for this. Let me just give you some for the parents, just something to think about, something I've observed. There's some parents that, that have uh, no consistency and how they talk to their kids. Let me tell you what I mean by that. They yell at everything. They have one tone for everything. And so what you've done is you've trained your kid to turn you out because they go, well, they yell about that and yell about this and yell about that. They just yell. That's who they are. So there's no way. Then there's other parents that are very consistent. When it's, they pick their battles. When it's something small, they will sit down and get on their level and say, honey, now we don't do that. We don't do that. But when they're doing something bad or crossing the line, then the tone changes. And those kids instantly recognize that tone I don't hear very often. It usually means something bad. I better stop. And that produces weight when we're as parents. There's another one. There's some parents that discipline. This is real easy. You can write this principle down. You do the crime, you pay the time. What I mean by that is if you do the crime, you don't do that. You don't, don't do that. And, and they learn pretty quick, and they're willful, aren't they, these little kids? There's some people that do this. You do the crime, we're going to sit in mediation until we figure out who has the most power. You know, y'all seen that in the grocery store. I want it. No. I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. No. I want it. No. I, okay, give me here. <laughs> That's called mediation. Yeah, what you need to do is done. No. Because you're training up this little child to become a big what? Adult. All right. Why is it some parents and teachers and coaches have weight when they speak? It's authority and respect. And I know parenting is hard. I know that. But there's a reason I'm sharing this illustration. Our kids will do things because they're all wired different. You need to pray for our grandchild. She's strong-willed. 
They're all wired different. There's some kids that are pleasers and they just want to make everybody happy. There's some kids that are just kind of wired for rebellion, it seems like. And, and some of the parents went, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're all wired different. But listen, some kids will obey because they love and they don't want to disappoint their parents. Almost to a fault. It's almost not healthy. They're so worried about upsetting their parents. There's others that will obey because fear. They're, they're afraid, I don't want to get it. I know I might get my hand smacked or I might get spanked or time out or I may lose my, my phone. So I'm going to obey, not because I want to, but because I what? Have to. I don't want to be punished. There's some that obey because they admire their parents. They want to make them proud. They just think their parents are the greatest thing and I, wouldn't, I want to make them proud of me. And you have some that obey out of self-preservation. I do not want to be embarrassed in this grocery line. So I better put it back. All right, this morning we're going to talk about what I believe is the greatest truth Christians wrestle with. I really do believe this. And I believe some of us are, have been deceived and don't even know it. And we see there's a lot of truths in this passage that are what I call foundational truths, like the divinity of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. Salvation is a work of God, a gift from Him. A person is saved by faith alone. We can see a lot of that in this passage. But I want to show you what I think we all struggle with. And we just have to settle this issue. And this has been going on since the garden, and it will go on until the end of Revelation. Look with me at John chapter 10, starting in verse 22. And I'm just going to read and give some commentary, and then we'll share these points. John chapter 10. It says, Now was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now, if you don't know what that is, there's a lot of meaning here that you can miss. The feast of, they're talking about feast of dedication, that is a celebration that happened because of a Maccabean revolt. In 165 BC, I'm going to try to say this name because I can see it in my head. I've got it phonetically spelled here, honey. You're going to be proud of me, so I can make sure. It's Antiochus Epiphanes came in to the temple and desecrated the altar. Desecrated the temple. Now, if you're Catholic, and we have a lot of Catholics here, you have this in your Catholic Bible, the book of Maccabees. And this story is in that book. They decided, the Maccabeans decided, we're not going to take it. And they started a revolt. And they ended up winning. They ended up bringing Israel a temporary independence. And they dedicated the temple. And they celebrate this every December. It's the Festival of Lights. We know it as what? Hanukkah. They dedicated the temple. And this is what is going on. They had cleansed the temple and they had the Feast of Lights, and it burned, the, the candles burned for, I believe it was eight days, I could be wrong on that, and the oil, even though they didn't have any, it didn't run out. It was a, a miraculous sign, and it was a time of celebration. So they're celebrating that event. Now I want you to think about this. This is the Feast of Lights, celebrating this, and here Jesus, this whole time we've been talking, this conflict between religious leaders and Jesus, He's been talking about, I am the light of the world. And now the light of the world is where? In the temple. When? At the Feast of Lights. And look what happens in verse 24. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Now just in our study of John, and there's a lot more, but just in our study of John, we've looked at Jesus turn the water to wine. We've looked at Jesus heal the official son that was close to death just by speaking it. We watched him heal an invalid by the pool. He's fed 5,000 people. He's walked on water. He's controlled the wind and the waves. And he's healed a man born blind and given him new eyes. That's just in this gospel. So they've seen these things. He's done all those miraculous signs. Look at verse 26. But you do not believe because you were not my sheep. As I've said to you, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Jesus, throughout his ministry, is going to make this connection between saving faith and following. 
He does not say you can intellectually just to believe it and it's okay and, and do what you want. He says, if you believe, you will follow. If you put your faith in me, you will follow me. They're tied together. They're one and the same. That's why James says faith without works is what? Is dead. You can't say I have faith and not trust God and walk with him. It's together. And that's what Jesus says. Sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Now listen to verse 28 because I want some of y'all to hear this. And I give them eternal life. Who gives eternal life? God. And they shall never perish. Now what does that mean? It's kind of a double saying there together, isn't it? It's almost like Jesus doesn't want you to miss it. Look at it. I missed it the first couple of times I read it. I will give them eternal life. Doesn't that assume you're never going to perish? And then he repeats it. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. If you have genuinely put, have put your faith in Christ and you're following him and he has given you eternal life, can you lose that? Now, I've had some people tell me this and I just laugh. Well, that verse there, as pastor says, no one. It doesn't say you can't. Now, don't laugh. They've been brought up in this. That's how they see this. But anyone means what? Anyone, including you. That is a gift. I want you to think about this because I know some of y'all struggle with this. Is salvation an act of man or of God? Can you undo what God has done? Can I be saved by faith and then keep my salvation by works? Because if I do that, salvation then depends on who? Me. So that's the hope of the Christian faith. It's not what I've done. It's what Jesus Christ has done. And Jesus is, is making this clear. Look at verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, when he says, I and the Father are one, that Greek word, I did not know this till this week, is neuter, not masculine. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? That's interesting. It means when Jesus said that, he is saying, I am of the same purpose, the same essence, the same nature. Me and God are on the same level. Now, look at the response. The Jews caught it and picked it up immediately. Verse 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, many good works I've shown you from my father. Which one of these works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, what? Make yourself out to be God, or make yourself God. They knew exactly what Jesus said, and Jesus said it exactly that way. Now look at verse 34. Now think about this. He's made this declaration. They are getting ready to stone him. That in today's terms mean kill you. Jesus doesn't backpedal. He doesn't, he's not a politician. He doesn't change his story. Well, wait a minute. That depends on what the word is, is. He doesn't do any of that. Look what he does. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you were God's? If he, talking about God the Father, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him who the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you were blaspheming because I said I'm the son of God? And let's stop right there. Put your finger, save your place in John, we're going to come back, but go to the book of Psalms. When I was a new Christian and I read this, it confused the dirt out of me. Is God declaring that man is divine? Is that what is being said? He said, isn't it written in your law, you were gods and God called them gods? Is he calling men gods? Is that what, it, let's look at where he's getting this. This is Psalm 82. He's quoting from Psalm 82. And the title of this psalm, and this, the title is part of the Word of God here, a plea for justice. There's some titles that have been put in our Bible, especially in the New Testament, but in the psalms, the titles are given to the psalms because they're the titles of the song. And so this is a plea for justice. 
So this is a prayer, if you will, a song, a crying out. And listen to the psalm. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Who is God talking to there? It says he judges among the what? The gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah, or Selah, some would say. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men, fall like ones of princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Now, when I was studying my Bible and I read that, it still left me confused. Because the Bible is very clear. The Lord our God, the Lord is what? One. There's only one true God. And so what we did is, back then, this was a long time ago, we began to study and we used some things, and I found out what was going on. Once I found out, it's like, oh, well, this makes perfect sense. And then I realized Jesus does a double whammy once you see it in the light of what I'm going to explain to you. God there is talking to the judges of the nation. The judges, if you will, were vice regents, if you will. They were put in place of God to judge the nation to uphold judge, judge, justice and to do judgments. And what they would use to judge was God's law. They did not make laws. They used God's law and then stood, if you will, in his place and did judgments for the nation. Chuck Swindoll puts it this way. The psalmist reminded Israel's appointed judges that they were like little gods and that they had been appointed by the supreme judge to rule in his stead. Therefore, they were not only had the authority, but they were accountable to him. They're to be ruling in God's place. Another one said this, he had given them the authority of life and death and to carry out his justice. Now, what Jesus is saying is, if you don't have a problem with a judge who God refers to as God, small g, because they're standing in place of him in judgment, Here's the double whammy. How can you miss me, who's the son of man, and I get to judge the world? He is reinforcing the fact that I am not a mere man. I'm what? I'm God. And they get it because they go to seize him. And he's going to have to break loose and flee. Jesus is saying, if the people who were put in charge of God's law and God's word and God in the Psalms, now this is interesting. In that passage we just read, Jesus says the law comes out of the Psalms. There's a lot in here we miss. And I'm going to hopefully break it up to you and you won't be confused when you leave. Maybe you all leave doing this. What was he talking about? He's saying if those that were entrusted with God's judgment over the nation were considered in his stead as God, and you have no problem calling yourself God because you're judges. Why is it after you've seen all I have done and all that I've told you and I have declared to you, why do you have problems with me calling me the son of God? He is not backing down from this. He is stepping up in their face. And he's used their word against them. The word they'd memorized, the word they had studied, the word that he will eventually say, these things speak of me. We've already studied that in John. If you believe me, you'd believe this word because it comes from my father. The issue that they had and the issue that we have and the issue that Jesus didn't have was how they viewed the word of God. Now, let me just give you some things to think about. God gave me something else, a curveball. Because there was something I, I was, while I was getting ready this morning, I'm going to share, and I'm guessing it's for somebody here. But listen, 
Jesus believed every word of the Bible. Every word. He believed the Old Testament was historical. And what many of us believe today as fiction, he believed as fact. Let me give you some. He believed Abel was a real person. I won't quote all these for time, but you can write them down. He believed Abel was a real person because he talks about it in Luke 11, verse 51. He believes that Noah and the days of Noah was real, Matthew 24, verse 37 and on. He believed in Noah and the flood, Luke 17, verse 26 and 27. He believed Abraham was a real person, John chapter 8, verses 56 and 58. He believed Sodom and Gomorrah was a real place and that it was destroyed, Matthew 10 and Luke 10. He believed that wife's, uh, Lot's wife was destroyed, Luke 17, 28 through 32. He believed in Isaac and Jacob, Matthew 18, 11 and Luke 13. He believed manna rained down from heaven and was angel food, John chapter 6, verses 31, 49 and 58. He believed in a serpent. He believed in Jonah the whale, Matthew 12, verse 39 and 41. He believed that Daniel and Isaiah were prophets. Now, why do I share that with you? Because many of us kind of come to God's word this way. Whether we want to admit it to ourselves or not. Parts of it is true, parts of it is not. I'll take what I like and I'll put out what I don't like. Then you have to admit that you are not following Christ in his view of the Bible. You just have to admit that and own that. I'm not doing it the way Christ did, and I don't believe it the way Christ did. And I hear this in a lot of ways, and I know a lot of it's just baby Christian and it's coming to know. But we say things like this. The God of the Old Testament was bad, but the God of the New Testament is great. Jesus doesn't let you get away with that. Because he says all of it is what? True. Some of us, I've heard somebody say this. I love Jesus and I love the writings of Peter and James. I can't stand Paul. He's a chauvinist. All right, what they're saying says more about what they view God, of their view of God, than of God's Word. Let me say that again. What they are saying is saying more about their view of God than God's Word. Let me tell you what the Old Testament says about God's Word. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. And that's Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Psalm 12, 6 says this, The words of the Lord are pure like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. Or let me say that again. This is the declaration. You shall keep them, O Lord. Meaning he's going to keep it and protect it. You shall preserve them for this generation and forever. Let me give you another one. This is from the Psalm 119, 160. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Psalm 119, 160. Jesus says this, It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. That would be like us saying today, even for one comma to be off. All right, now, i got your attention. The Bible declares about itself, God is going to protect it. God is going to preserve it. God is going to give it to us for generations, forever. His word is eternal. We will have this book in heaven. God has been the author of it. Here's the truth that we struggle with. Did God reveal his word to men and they recorded it accurately? Or did men just kind of give their opinion and write it down and we have to guess? And each one of us has to make that decision. If you stand here, then you have to erase every verse I just read to you out of your Bible. <coughs> you have to. And when Jesus says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for the smallest comma, so to speak, to be removed, then you have to erase that. And what you have just done is you have stood in judgment of this book and said, I get to judge whether this is true or not. Or, if you're like me, 
I've come to believe every little jot and tittle in this book is by design. And that God has protected it word for word. And that He, through His supernatural power, has revealed this to us. And so this book stands in judgment of who? Me. And so parents and teachers and adults and children, be careful when we say, well, I don't like this, but I like that. Because really what you're doing is saying this really isn't God's what? And say, well, we really don't know what's actually true. You know, there's been so much changes. And you're saying more about what you think of God than what you're saying about this book. Because what you're saying is God's not big enough to keep and protect his what? His word. Can we own that church? Now, this is hard for some of us because I know y'all struggle with some of this. So I want to give you something just to think about. Here's three points. Three points in 10 minutes. We can do this. You ready? Number one, all of God's word is true. Jesus says in this passage, God's word cannot be what? Broken. When I give a promise to my wife and say, honey, I promise I'm going to take the trash up next week and then I don't keep it. That is called a broken what? Promise. When Jesus says God's word can't be broken, that's good news for us because what he's saying is there's no way God can break that. He has to keep it because it's 100% true. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till everything is fulfilled. He's saying this book has has integrity and consistency. Now, now how does God prove that to us? Because he knows we're skeptical by nature. So how does God prove that to us? In Isaiah 46, it says this, I will make known the end from the beginning, the ancient times, things yet to come. There's a book called The Odds, uh, What Are the Odds of Things from A to Z? And some nerdy guys sat down and figured out with all the variables, all these kind of things we deal with in life and given us the odds. It'd be good if they could give us the odds on the lottery, right? What day to play. But what they do is they give us some interesting facts. And, and look what it says. This is interesting. You have a 1 in 250 million chance of being struck by lightning today. That's pretty good odds that I'm not going to get struck. I saw a video two weeks ago. A guy got, it was a security camera. The guy got hit by a bolt of lightning, and he was out. And he got up, and he sat up, he shook himself off. No lie, started to walk, bam, got hit again. I was like, I don't know what he did, but somebody's angry. <laughs> got hit twice. You have one in 250 million chance of being struck today. However, over your lifetime, the variables change. Over your entire life, you have one in a 9,100 chance of being struck by life. Because exposure, being in storms, travel, all these things, they, they increase the odds. There were some prophecies made about the coming of the Messiah from Micah, the prophet Isaiah, Malachi, Zechariah, where he was going to be born, when it was going to happen. And what they did is they took, just give me an example of how they predict these things, out of the hundreds of cities, so they figured up all the cities during that time and all the nations of that time, and it was made 700 years before, and they take all those odds and put it together. And there was two gentlemen name is Peter Stoner and Robert Newman. What they did, and they wrote a book called Science Speaks, they used science and probability, and it was vouched for by the American Scientific Affiliation. They took eight prophecies about Jesus Christ out of 60 and figured up the odds of him fulfilling eight. And the number they came up with was one with 17 zeros behind it. Now, when we shared this with the youth years ago, that doesn't mean a lot to a youth. So what we did is we broke it down. I think you'll appreciate this. They came up with a picture to help people understand the odds of that. They said, if you covered the state of Texas two feet, two feet deep with silver dollars, one silver dollar was marked and thrown into the state of Texas, and it was all stirred up. And then they placed you in Texas, I mean in Dallas, and you left from Dallas, and you could walk in any direction you wanted to. And you walked until you felt you wanted to grab one, 
and you stopped and you bent down and you grabbed one and picked it up, the odds of you doing that is the odds of what Christ did, fulfilling the prophecies about himself. The odds are crazy. That's a fancy way of saying there's no way it's a coincidence. Now, why do I share that with you, church? God knows we're skeptical people. And he knows we struggle with truth. And so what he declared in Isaiah is this, I'm going to prove to you that this word is true because I'm going to make known the end from the beginning and from ancient times what is still to come. And it's going to happen with 100% accuracy, 100% of the time, until the end comes. There's 333 prophecies about Christ. A lot of those are about his second coming. He's fulfilled all of them in his first coming, and the odds of that is incredible. There's over 2,500 2, prophecies in your Bible, and 2,000 of them have come true, word for word. Why am I driving this home? Because I need you to understand that we can put our trust in his what? Word. Jesus believed it, and we need to believe it too. It is, is it just some true or all true? All true. And if it's all true, that means God has to keep every one of the promises he's given us. He has to have the future unfold as he has declared it. What he has said about himself is absolutely true. And it should have some authority and weight in our life. The question is, do we have him as our authority and do we respect him? The second thing I want you to think about is this. A child of God is one who desires to know his word. A Christian should be marked as a listener. We're not very good at that as Christians. Your pastor's sometimes guilty of that. But we as Christians should be listeners. Quick to, quick to speak and slow to listen. Is that what the Bible says? Is that what the Bible says? What does it say? Be quick to listen, slow to speak. We should be listeners and students and learners. And we should be deeply desiring to master this body of truth here. Remember, I've been sharing this, and these are things that I do over and over and over again because I want it in your head. Four sources of authority. Can anybody quote them to me? Feelings, traditions, intellect, and God's Word. And a child of God wants to know the truth so we can get all of those under the authority of God's Word. So when Jesus is in the garden and he's feeling this way, Lord, if there's any other way that we can do this. His feelings were there. He's human. He's all God, but he's human. He's saying, Lord, if there's any other way, if this cup can pass, that's his feeling speaking. But then what does he say? Not my will, but yours. And so there's times that our passions overdrive our mind. Would y'all agree with that? We do things we, we know we shouldn't be doing, but it's like our desires are just out of control. And God says, no, I want my word to come in and counteract that. There's a verse in, in Mark that says this. Jesus is speaking. You invalidate the word of God by your traditions, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Mark 7, 13. There's some traditions we hold to, and we even do those in the name of God. And they're not under God's word. They're under my authority. And Jesus says, don't do that. There's times that our intellect, we think we know it all, the Bible says there's a knowledge that puffs up and we think we're right and we know what's best and we know how to handle this. And God's Word says no, because my truth produces a sense of humility and humbleness and teachability. It's peaceful. It's pure. How many of y'all know Christians like that? Humble, peaceful, pure, and you can learn from them. And then there's Christians that just know it all. And I don't know about you, this is what I do with those. I was cutting you off. I'm, I'm glad you know all that. A child of God should desire to know his word. And this is the last one. A child of God should obey the word because it has weight. When Jesus said, you cannot enter into heaven unless you become like a child, he does not mean be childish, but like a child. Yesterday, when they were saying, hey, come here, sweetie. No, don't do that. And they listened and turned. What I noticed, at least in my experience as I was observing that, I did this. What a good parent. That parent is skilled. What a great little girl. She is so sweet. 
But then the ones I saw doing the mediation and negotiating and stop, 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 stop. I did, this is what I did. That poor soul. Oh, that child is, oh, bad. The Bible says this. He who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son that causes shame and brings reproach. And the rod of rebuke gives wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame. Listen, a parent comes and teaches a child this. The world doesn't revolve around you. It doesn't. We like it to, but it doesn't. A parent also teaches out this. You don't know what's best for you all the time. Cake for breakfast is not good. You do not need help, and you can't do it all by yourself. And God's word comes and says this, Larry, you're not the center of all things. Put your name there. Just put your name there. Blank. You're not the center of all things. And I know what's best for you. I know the plans I have for you. And the child who listens not only brings glory to the parent, but to the child. And many of us are stuck because we want to obey in certain parts and we want to disobey in other parts. And God says, if you will just delight yourself in me, I will give you the desires of your heart. You know why we don't want to obey God? The same reason Adam and Eve didn't want to obey God. They're scared they're going to miss out on something. I'll miss out on the joy. If I don't go do that, my friends, I'm going to miss out. They're going to think I'm weird. And God comes and says this, my word is true. It's not going to change. If you go do these things, it may you may have some fun, but this is what the Bible says. There's pleasure in sin for what? For a season, but it leads to what? Death and regret. The things I did that my parents didn't want me to do, some of the stories you've heard, brought hurt into my life that followed me like a shadow even at 47 years old. If only I'd listen to mom and dad now. But you know what? I knew what was what? What was best? No, they knew what was best, and I should have dumped that girl a long time ago. Here's what I want you to think about as we leave today. Do you really believe God's word is true? And if you do, are you willing to surrender your life and put your life into his hands and submit and obey to that word. Because church, if we would do that, I really believe in all my heart that not only would our church be better, but Essex County would be better. Is it easy being a Christian and doing that? No, it's not. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do, but it's the best thing you'll ever do. Do I believe that the Bible says that my God is gracious and merciful and his kindness are new every day? Because it's true. Do I believe that I am wonderfully and fearfully made and he desires that none should perish? Because that's true. Do I believe I am a sinner and any man who says he has no sin is a liar and the truth is not in him and I'm even more wicked than I ever thought? Because that's true. And do I believe I need a savior and he's not just asking me for, I'm not asking him just for forgiveness so I can go to heaven. I'm putting my life in his hands saying, you can do with me whatever you want. I will follow you. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we all wrestle not so much with the fact that your word is true. Many of us believe that in our heart and in our head. The, the difference is we don't believe it in such a way that we follow. That when we spend our quiet time and you speak to us, that we do what you ask us to do. Or when we're listening to a sermon on the car radio, going to work, and he quotes a verse, and I know I need to go reconcile myself or humble myself or to watch what I say to stop gossiping. We don't believe it's true enough to follow you. 
because we're scared we're going to miss out on something. And yet you tell us if we delight ourselves in the Lord, you would give us the desires of our heart. And Father, many of us desire peace and rest, a slower pace. And you desire to give us all of that, but we don't delight ourselves in you. We don't take your word the way we should. Father, help us, including the pastor, to submit ourselves to your word and to believe it. Help us not to be so negative. Help us not to be so jaded by this dark world we're in. Help us to pray for those in authority over us that we may live a peaceable life. Help us to obey. Help us to humble ourselves and to seek your face and to turn from our wicked ways, knowing that you will hear our cries in heaven. You will forgive our sins and you'll heal our land. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ham, our closing hymn today will be hymn 571. And as we sing this, I want you, I don't want you sitting here to this day, and I'm the same way. I do the same thing. Don't do this. I am so glad they're here. They needed to hear that. I want you to say, God, what did you tell me today, and what do I need to do? And help me to walk it out, live it out. So let's stand and sing as we meditate on that truth and commit some things to him. Let's stand and sing. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray as we just sang that we will walk by your side and not in the way. And that what you say we will do, where you send us, we will go. And that we will trust and obey. Father, the reason we don't trust you is because we don't let you have authority and we don't respect you. And forgive us. We want our country to be turned around and we want revival and yet we don't want to follow and it doesn't work that way. Faith and following go hand in hand. So help us, all of us, to let your word stand in judgment of us instead of us judging your word and help us to obey as Christ did, to believe every word, to desire to know it, to think and study it, and to obey it so we can bring glory to our Father and not shame. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Hug somebody before you go home.